and we're live. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us again today. We hope you're well and staying sane amidst all the uh, back to school madness. Um, for those of you who have, haven't joined us before, um, I'm the Programs and Communications Manager at the Marine Museum of the Great Lakes at Kingston. And uh, as some of you may know, or hopefully all of you know, the museum is open and located at, currently at Portsmouth Olympic Harbor, where we're offering free guided tours of our small storefront gallery. Um, and we're open now for the autumn, Monday to Saturday, 10 to 4. For those of you who don't know, uh, the museum's mission uh, is to encourage um, the maritime, a connection with the maritime heritage of Kingston and the Great Lakes. And that maritime connection um, and maritime heritage is as much about the social and economic history of the region as it is about the life that inhabits that area and our surroundings. So as we work to move towards back towards our historic 55 Ontario Street property, and as you'll see from our new strategic plan um, on our website, the museum is very much committed to incorporating the environmental narrative into our gallery and, and our educational programs. Uh, we already offer a couple of uh, environmental science programs to local youth. And so last June, we invited a Maven Armstrong of Turtles Kingston to talk to us about turtles, uh, the threats they face and what we can do to help. Over the summer, I'm sure many of you witnessed uh, turtles laying eggs, crossing the roads, uh, perhaps sunbathing on the log, and if you were lucky enough, swimming. Um, I was actually fortunate enough to encounter my first uh, spiny softshell turtle not long after our conversation with Maven last time, so I was very excited uh, to finally see one and uh, definitely caught me off guard because it was a bit uh, it was interesting color and size uh, is definitely not what I was expecting, but uh, finally be able to take that off the list was very exciting for me. So thank you, Maven, for being able to uh, explain a bit more about the different types of turtles that we have in our area. So without, I'm going to introduce our, our speaker today, Maven Armstrong from Turtles Kingston. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, Turtles Kingston is an informal group of concerned citizens uh, responding to the plight of turtles found in the Kingston area, all of, all of whom are identified as species at risk. Uh, the city is located in the middle of a provincially significant wetland, so there are many conflicts that arise between development and the environment. In 2012, the city commissioned an environmental study to determine the status of turtle populations. The McIntosh Perry Environmental Report identified five turtle hotspots. In 2014, the city addressed one of the five hotspots, but unfortunately the remaining four have not yet been addressed. Uh, so Turtles Kingston was created in 2014 to help defray the cost of the installation of exclusion, of exclusion fencing for the first, for first hotspot through various fundraising initiatives. Uh, the city received a grant um, from the Ministry of Natural Resources, the SAR Stewardship Program, and the public uh, contributed a significant amount of money to, uh, with the city to provide the balance. I think the overall cost of the project was 100, over 100,000, 100, about $116,000. That's right. Um, so Maven uh, moved to the Kingston area in 2014 and had to travel through a prominent wetland, air, da wetland area daily on her way to work. That well wetland is actually one of the five hotspots uh, that was identified in 2012 and that also had the highest road mortality. Mabin, who had hoarded the carnages she witnessed uh, during the nesting season and vowed to address the plight of the turtles. She began researching turtles in 2016 and says she is now has a PhD in turtleology. It's a fun word to say. Uh, she retired in 2018 and has devoted her, herself full time to the turtle cause in the area. She relaunched Turtles Kingston in the early spring of 2018, starting with the creation of a Facebook page, Turtles Kingston, which I encourage you to follow, and we will include the link uh, in our live chat, to sensitize and educate the public. The goal was to create a Facebook community that could be motivated to take action in the cause for the turtles. The main objectives of Turtles Kingston is to continue with the mitigation efforts uh, of the remaining hotspots identified in the environmental report, so to help um, uh, mitigation being to be able to help moderate and uh, improve the situation and ensure that there's a balance between the two um, and fight of course for the rights of the turtles in our area. So we'll start today uh, with an update from Aben about the work that's been happening over the summer since our last talk in June and the status on turtle hatchlings which are the cute little guys that are very well camouflaged crossing the road sometimes. Uh, we'll then open the screen up to Q&A where we invite you to send your questions over the YouTube chat uh, or by email to marmuse, that's M-A-R-M-U-S, at marmuseum.ca. And again, I'll put the link to the email in this live chat for you to see. So Maven, I turn it over to you 
and at the same time we'll have uh, some pictures showing of uh, images that may have been selected over the summer. Thank you very much, Michelle. It's my pleasure to be here and I welcome everyone that's participating today. I look forward to this talk. I always look forward to a talk to educate people on turtles because they're in such big trouble. So this uh, workshop was entitled uh, Turtle Trenches. Um, I'll explain that a little further along. Um, what it's like to, uh, uh, sorry, I just have to, a, a technical glitch here. One moment. Oops, sorry, there is a technical is. glitch here. Maybe if you could cancel the image for right now. Sure, I can do that. Uh, for some reason, it's taking over my entire screen. I don't know why. Okay. Um, that's, uh, I'm not quite sure what to do about that because I need um, access to my screen. It's, uh, in the top uh, top right, you should see a different uh, viewer option. So that it says, should say, it might say speaker view or gallery view. But it's just, it's odd that when the photos came up that it went full screen, it didn't give me a choice. Yeah, I'll try. Right, okay. Um, along the top, then there would be a bar that drops down to give you an option of how to view it. Okay, so I have that. So try it again, and I'll see what happens with this if it uh, takes over again. The joys of modern technology, everybody. Yes, there <laughs> we go. You think we'd be Zoom experts by now. There you go, yes. Can yeah, you see it okay now? Oh, no, it took over again. So on the top, one second. On the, along the top, there should be a bar that pops down. No, that's still not working. Uh, I can still see you talking, so you can you can continue if you like, or we can I can remove the share. Oh, I think I got it now. I think I got it now. There. All right. Now we can apologize for that. <laughs> uh, we'll try to make up for that um, somewhere along in the talk. So um, I always like to start a turtle talk with talking about the importance that turtles play to uh, us and to our lives and the environment. Um, it has to do with our freshwater sources. And you might in this talk hear things repeated from the first talk, but uh, you do have to hear things seven times before it goes in. So this is number two. <laughs> <laughs> um, only 2.7% of the world's water is a freshwater source. Now that's really important to know, 2.7%. 20% of that is actually found here in Ontario. Turtles are often called the janitors. And that's because of the vast amounts of bacteria producing carrion or flesh and decaying vegetation that they consume. They, they keep our freshwater sources clean. Uh, that's a super important function. If we were to remove them, for example, from a wetland, that wetland would implode with bacteria and most likely you wouldn't get it back. Um, there's an expression that's used that turtles are like the rivets on a plane. If you lose too many, the plane's not going to fly. And I like to think of them as a rung on the ladder of biodiversity. This is an old cliche, but behind every cliche, there's a truth. So we've heard a lot about that word biodiversity. We've heard the recent studies that have been done that this planet has lost 70% of species over the last hundred years. Like this is crucial what is happening. So if you think of turtles um, as a rung on that ladder of biodiversity, if you were to remove them, because they are so close to extinction, you'd lose a rung to that ladder. And you can't very effectively climb a ladder that's missing, missing rungs. They do a lot more good than they, they do basically no harm. Um, they accumulate significant amounts of uh, toxic compounds like pesticides, PCBs, DDT, um, that is why they are unfit for human consumption. They don't have kidneys that function like ours do. Ours are able to expel these toxins. They do not. They accumulate them. That uh, is precisely why if you were to sit down to a meal of turtle, you're basically sitting down to a meal of toxic waste. So apart from the fact that it's just principally not uh, a right thing to do, uh, turtles are herbivores, they're carnivores, and they're omnivores, meaning that they eat plants, they eat flesh, uh, or both. Um, sometimes they're the top predator in their habitats. Uh, their eggs are certainly a, fo a food source for a wide variety of predators like skunks, raccoons, and foxes. 
And adult turtles can also be preyed upon. Um, there was a lake in Algonquin Park that the common snapping turtle population was pretty much wiped out because of two otters. And that population will not be replaced in our lifetime. That's, uh, it's gonna take decades for them to replace themselves. Turtles are a keystone species. That is like beavers. Keystone species are species that other species depend upon. And if anything was to happen to them, it would create a cascade of consequences, not just on their populations, but on the other populations that are dependent on them. So that's a really important reason, again, as to why we need to protect them. Uh, there's an unusual concern right now that people that are born now into a world without a large number of turtles think that that is the norm. Now, these turtles perform essential ecosystem functions. So this is not the norm to have reduced populations. So it's a little more of a challenge to motivate these people into doing something to respond to the decline in the turtle populations because they've always they've only known that so the impact of that would soon be revealed because it would decline the ecosystems and maybe to a point where when we realize it, it would be too late to effectively intervene so that is a, a challenge that conservationists are are uh, engaging in right now. I also like to reference the importance of wetlands. Wetlands are the most endangered ecosystems on the planet. We've lost 87% of the world's wetlands in the last 300 years. We've lost 35% of them in the last 50 years since 1970. 73% of the wetlands in Ontario are gone. Southern Ontario had the greatest percentage of wetlands in Canada, and we've wiped out 73% of them because of uh, due to development. Um, they're disappearing three times faster than our, than our forests. And of course, when they disappear, everything living in them disappears as well. More than 25% of wetland plants and animals, which comprise 40% of all the world's species, are at risk of extinction. And many of the remaining species are on a decline as well. Uh, wetlands clean and store our fresh water. They're a major source of nutrition, uh, including fish and rice. Rice being a staple for three and a half billion people on this planet, uh, that they depend on that. Um, then they're one of the world's most effective carbon sinks. They sequester vast amounts of carbon so that they play a humongous role in climate regulation, in climate change. And we can't attest to that more than this summer with the heat that we had going into a, a, a level one drought for those intense temperatures for extended periods of time, something's changing. I mean, California uh, can speak for us all right now. Um, there's five species of turtles in the Kingston area. There's 10 in Canada, eight in Ontario, and the five in the Kingston area are the common snapper, Midland painted, the pretty one with the orange trim, the snapping turtle being the largest species in Canada, the northern map turtle, which are also very beautiful. They have that beautiful color of bright green striped, um, st striped bodies. Their carapace or their upper shell looks like a map. That's where they get their name from. The Eastern musk turtle, which is the smallest turtle in Canada, also known as the stink pot, who also gets its name because it releases a musk on the sides of the carapace. They think that, that um, it's not just a defensive action. They think that it's actually a way that the musk turtle uses to communicate. I guess it's some kind of a love potion. Not quite sure, but to us, it's certainly not um, a pleasant smell. <laughs> And then of course, there's the Blanding's turtles. They are the lovely turtles with the big smiles, with the bright yellow necks. And uh, they are classified as threatened, that meaning that their habitat is supposed to be protected. They are second on the level. The four previous turtles that I mentioned are all what are classified as special concern. Um, all the turtles are registered as species at risk. They're, they're in big trouble. Uh, Blanding's turtles um, 
unfortunately, with our present administration, government uh, administration, who pretty much eradicated the Environmental Protection Act this year, um, the protections have been seriously compromised. Instead of increasing the protections, they've actually been reduced. They've, they're facilitating the development of different uh, areas. The uh, Toronto Green Belt is a good reference to that. The, um, our premier was not able to get that through the first time he tried because somebody recorded uh, in a meeting that he had with developers that he would allow them to develop 65% of the green belt. And then um, his back pocket uh, way to get back at developing the green belt because he wants to put up another 400 series road through it. And that is just going to bring more and more development into a key area of wetlands, of agriculture. It's, it's actually insanity. Um, that was his initiative was to change the Environmental Protection Act, which would facilitate developers being able to do that. It's referred to as the pay to slay, meaning that if there's a risk population in one area, the developer can basically eradicate it if he makes a cash donation to another area in compensation. Well, that doesn't make any sense at all. It really, in terms of conservation, that's just insanity. So you think we'd learn in this pandemic, and I understand that there's economic recovery to be done, but it has to be done responsibly. Um, this might be a serious situation of I told you so, and uh, don't it always seem to go, that you don't know what you have till it's gone. So we strongly encourage everyone to advocate, to get involved, to write letters, to make calls, anything to protect the environment because it's it's that precarious. It belongs to us all. It's essential to us all. Uh, we know that nature can survive without us, but we certainly can't survive without her. And um, I think we're tipping the scale of uh, arrogant exploitation um, at this point. So we all do have to get involved for the sake of our own lives, for our children, for our grandchildren. Um, to make, ensure that we're taking the necessary steps to advocate for something that will have a serious impact on us, on us all. Um, turtles are in big trouble. They're the most endangered vertebrate species on the planet, uh, more than polar bears. I hate to compare because they're all in big trouble, but turtles are in really big trouble. They've been on the planet for 220 million years. And I was actually approached by a paleontologist at a workshop that I gave north of the city who who gave me the research paper to show that they've actually been on the planet for 320 million years. They've survived five world cataclysms. They walked with the dinosaurs and they survived what the dinosaurs couldn't. But in less than 50 years, we humans have brought them to the brink of their extinction. So we owe them big time. We have to intervene to make sure that this species is still on this planet. Like I said, they are your water cleaners. If you remove them, your fresh water sources implode. We have three provinces that are presently experiencing water issues. We're seeing populations um, migrating, looking for fresh water on this planet because of climate change. So we have 20% of that 2.7% of the world here in Ontario. So we have a moral and ethical and environmental obligation to protect those waters. Right hand in hand with turtles because they are who help keep those waters clean. Um, they can live anywhere from 50 to 150 years on average in the wild. Uh, common snapping turtle can live up to 80 years. I say in the wild because we've introduced threats to them. So their longevity has been reduced again because of our activities. They reach, <clears throat> excuse me, sexual maturity later in life. Usually um, uh, a, a number of them that are found in this area, the average age would be 18 when they're sexually mature. That affects their life cycle as well because it's, uh, it, it takes a while for them to get there, to be able to reproduce, to replace themselves. Um, so <clears throat> moving on to hatchlings, we, I always like to challenge the 
to explain the challenges. Hatchlings um, face a lot from conception to birth, <coughs> excuse me, and for a number of years afterwards. If we start with nesting turtles, uh, the main reasons for the decline in their numbers is the loss of habitats. I mean, the wetlands being developed, where do the turtles go? So there isn't much done in the way of replacing that. Um, we are beginning to see that in relation to uh, climate change, countries like Scotland, Ireland are reintroducing wetlands because they realize mother nature had it best. Um, the man-made efforts that we've made for water control in times of drought and flood are not working. Uh, there's a huge industrial area in Toronto that they are reverting to wetland because of the realization that mother, mother nature knew what she was doing. So uh, turtles will play a, a significant part in that. Um, <clears throat> so you have a turtle that nested in this area before, then all of a sudden that year it's developed and the turtle, I mean, they go back to the same nesting spots decade after decade. So sometimes within a meter of where they nested the previous uh, years. So they go up in this area and it, everything's changed, everything's ripped out. Turtles don't do well when they're forced to rehabituate somewhere else. Um, that's why when we have injured turtles that are taken and don't survive the road trauma and the eggs are removed and incubated and they hatch, it's essential that those hatchlings be released in the same area that the mother turtle was brought in from. They don't do well when they're forced to change their areas. They've been here over 320 million years. So they've survived so much, but things that we force them to survive, they, they can't. It's asking too much from the species. Um, road mortality. Road mortality is uh, uh, the second highest reason for their decline in numbers. Turtles need to nest in lovely substrate that they can dig in where there's little or no vegetation so that their eggs are exposed directly to the sun where they can incubate. So roadsides are perfect for that. Unfortunately, the roadsides also carry the risk. Um, we have observed uh, turtles nesting for a number of years and we're not always guaranteed that when the female comes up and nests that she's gonna to return to the water source on the same side that she nested. Some of them make the fatal error in trying to cross. I wish I spoke turtle, I really do. <laughs> Cause it takes nine minutes average for a turtle to cross a two lane road. So on a road, like for example, at the Westbrook wetland with more than 11,000 cars a day, she's not gonna make it she is just not going to make it. So she will require our intervention to get her safely across the road. Um, there's lots of information on Turtles Kingston as to how to respond to um, assisting turtles on the road, like having what we call a turtle road warrior kit, which is a, a bin that the lid has been aerated that is lined and that's for transporting an injured or a dead turtle. Dead turtle, uh, like I said, you can't always determine if they are dead because their metabolisms are, are slow. Um, so we recommend if you don't know, transport it anyway, because of the fact that, uh, especially in the spring, it's very likely a, a gravid female, a female that's carrying eggs and her eggs, if she doesn't you know, survive her road trauma can be extracted and incubated and then the hatchlings released in that same area in the fall. So um, also gloves, definitely a high res vest. That is really important to be well seen, um, you know, stop when it's safe to do so. All the safety precautions are there in, in video and in written form um, on our uh, on our Facebook page and also um, how to carry turtles. Like the smaller ones, it's easy. They're like hamburgers. You just pick them up with both hands securely and and cross them in the direction that they were heading and make sure that they're well off the road. And snapping turtles, snapping turtles get a bad rap. We talked about this the last time as well. They, their bottom shell or their plastron, if you were to turn them over, you'd see it's very small. There's no way that they can retract into it. They're the only species in Canada that can't, basically. So their only means of defense is to snap. And you're usually... 
uh, meeting a nesting female. Um, they're semi-aquatic. They spend most of their time in water. So when they're on land, they feel vulnerable. So they're a little more reactive and she's going to be nesting. So she's going to be testy, a little testy anyway. So there's a method that we call the pizza hold method that you can see the videos on our Facebook page and on other uh, turtle sites as well, where you just anchor their tail with your less dominant hand, slide your dominant hand underneath the plastron. They'll usually snap or jerk when you first pick them up. So you're prepared for that to not drop them. Then you get them to waist height, anchor your elbow in your waist, and that way everyone can see you. We advocate that method, for example, in Westbrook. You don't want to be bending over, dragging them on a carpet when there's 11,000 cars a day going through. This way, once you've done this method once, you will never do it any other way. And you just bring the turtle up. Everyone can see what you're doing. 99% of the cars will stop to allow you to cross the road with that turtle. You put it back down. Sometimes just before uh, about a foot off the ground, it will jerk again. It will snap and jerk again. If you're prepared for that, no problem. Um, you don't want to drop them. Their carapaces are heavy and it can result in injury to them. So there's tons of information on uh, our Facebook page related to all issues um, responding to turtles in need, how to transport them if they're injured, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. And if you have any questions, you can certainly ask more ab about that. Um, in relation to, we're still on the topic of the threats to survivability of turtles. Nest predation, less than 1% of all turtle eggs make it to sexual maturity, mostly because of predation. We have issues with uh, urban development where we're bringing what we call subsidized predators. In other words, there are skunks, raccoons, foxes that are living in these areas because now there's human waste. So like the developments that we're seeing that are being built in Kingston, <laughs> basically in the wetlands, well, we're bringing those numbers of predators right to the uh, turtle eggs, for one. Um, it's really shameful. This should not be allowed to continue. Um, Kingston really has to wake up and smell the swamp water because um, they're fooling around with something they really have no right to fool around with in their um, negligence of um, authorizing these developments to go up that close to wetlands. It's a manipulation um, that's happening, um, but there's no integrity in it. There's no ethics in it. I can guarantee you that. Um, so nest predation is something that uh, we can help with, uh, especially with uh, Lee Valley that came on board um, with fabricating the nest protectors and selling them at the uh, for the cost of the price it is to make them. Uh, like I said, we sold over 250 last year. And um, so that can make a significant uh, difference to the hatchling populations. Poaching. Um, I would imagine anyone that's listening to this is aware of the horrific event that happened this year. It was the first year that we were able to protect. Uh, you can see on the screen there, our turtle trenches were there, those black tubes. Um, we were really looking forward because we are in the midst of working with the city on mitigating that wetland. And um, we wanted to ensure we were on the road for 39 straight days, making sure that the adult female uh, population was protected. We didn't want to lose one because we wanted the population to start off with the best possible numbers after it's mitigated. So we did not lose one adult female. Um, we were looking forward to 400 and something hatchlings and we lost over 300 to a poaching incident. That was very, very difficult to, to accept. They were taken right at the time when they were emerging. We did manage to have 53 that emerged successfully and other nests that were protected that we weren't aware of that existed. And you can see in the, um, that's a result of the poaching in that image there. Uh, there was no vandalism. The, the material was not destroyed. The person knew what they were after. And um, we created these series of 
what I call turtle trenches, which um, one of our volunteer drivers had suggested attaching to the frame. I was going to make them go around the nest protectors and down to the water as an exclusion fence, and he suggested attaching them. So we did. We cut out the tops of them, a big strip, as you see there, which facilitated light and also hydration so that the turtles, all the exits were blocked off except for that one. So the hatchlings were forced to go to it to go down to the water and they would be instinctively drawn to that because they do slope directly down to the water. We lined them with the local substrates so that they were walking on something uh, natural and something that they would later be familiar with. And that is because I couldn't bear the thought of protecting all these nests and arriving the next morning and find road mortality, finding hundreds of them squashed by cars. They're the size of toonies. So this way they were protected that they would have to take this one lane trench down to the water's edge. And we estimated that there wouldn't be much predation, that it would be awkward for a predator to like a raccoon to get its hand in there or a bird. And, and we were checking them three times a day. So we weren't really concerned about that. Um, the substrate stayed in place because of the corrugated bottom of the, of the tube. So there was no chance after a few really heavy rains that that substrate would collect at the end of the tube and block it. No risk of that happening. So we were really excited to evaluate this inventive idea as an eco passage and unfortunately never got the opportunity because the uh, hatchlings were stolen. Um, so uh, another thing is the turtles as bycatch in the commercial fishing industry. We talked about that, that we had two conditions of license put on the commercial licenses that you know, the number and species had to be recorded and that they had to put the jugs for flotation to give the chance for the turtles to survive breathing air. Um, so um, let me see, sorry, I'm just moving on here. Uh, one thing that's really important to know is um, you are, you're never allowed to pick up and move a turtle nest. They can, that has to be done by uh, someone who is uh, permitted and authorized and licensed to do so. Um, the eggs, the embryo attaches to the inside of the shell. If they're not moved correctly, they will not survive. Um, so if there is a situation where a, a nest has to be removed, then contact. You can actually contact the MNRF also to ask them if there's someone available that could be assigned to do that because they're aware of who's permitted and um, who is not. Um, so uh, the females, after they finish nesting, because that's the first stage of the hatchling, um, with all the risks that are going on, uh, they, this year they all seem to pile up because of the drought at the water sources, because the rest of the water channels in the, in the wetland dried up. So they were restricted to these areas and they were nesting one on top of the other. We had one that even crawled under, dug under a nest protector, existing nest protector and nested there. So that's why we had more hatchlings coming out because there were nests that we were unaware of that were incidentally protected by the protector. So that was great. We, we figured that there's at least a hundred hatchlings from those incidents that survived. We, we did have the 20 that succumbed to uh, road mortality. Um, so that was, uh, that was like a compensation for what had happened. Um, there are fines attributed to messing around with an endangered species that can go anywhere from $25,000 to $100,000 with a, uh, a, a year in jail or more. So, um, there are numbers that can be called that we have on our site on our Facebook page calling the MNR tip line or you can call anonymously to Crime Stoppers to report anything that you see that is uh, fishy. Um, there was a vehicle seen late at night on the Saturday when these uh, turtles were, were taken. Um, the next thing is turtles as pets, uh, absolutely never. They're wild animals. They're meant to live their lives in the wild. Exotic pets for us are non-existent. They contribute to the 
poaching incidents and illegal trade of because of the demand. Um, they were never meant to be pets. They should be left in the wild to live their lives as nature intended. Red-eared sliders are a good example of that. They are the common little turtle that people purchase when they want a pet turtle. Trouble is it grows. It will live to 50 years. <laughs> you lose interest in it. You have to get larger containers. They're prone to salmonella because oftentimes their water isn't changed often enough. So they become a health risk and people get fed up with them. So what do they do? They release them into the wild. Well, they're not an indigenous species. They come from the Southern states. They look very much like a painted turtle, except they have that red stripe going down the side of their head, which is why they get their name, red-eared sliders. So they compete for the limited resources to our indigenous populations like the paintings. So they, they, they threaten our population. So the worst thing you can do is to release a turtle into, into the wild. Well, if, if you have one as a pet turtle. There are um, organizations that will take them, but they will try to relocate them to someone else who is interested in having a pet turtle. Um, but really it, it should be legislated that they sh it should not be permitted. They just should not be allowed to uh, have these as, um, as pets. So if you do see a hatchling, the hatchlings generally emerge from the end of August to even as like early October, depending on the weather. Um, and you can sometimes see them in the spring. Now that's something miraculous because those are hatchlings that have overwintered. They, they leave the shell in the fall, but they stay in the subterranean nest and they actually feed off of the shell through the winter. It's really quite incredible because they, um, they can withstand freezing temperatures. They have a natural freeze uh, tendency or tolerance. Uh, they can withstand exposure to ice and cold without freezing because they remove agents from their bodily fluids, which creates an effective barrier uh, preventing them from having ice form in their bodies. Uh, it's, it's miraculous. They can only do that the one time. Painteds do that often, northern map turtles. They all can, but th that, those two particular species do it more on a, on a regular basis. So they emerge in the spring. They basically thaw <laughs> and because um, they're only six inches or so below the surface. Uh, they're in the freezing zone, but um, they emerge in the spring. So you'll see baby turtles crawling around in May when the other turtles are nesting. So it's, it's quite miraculous. It's fascinating to think how they emerge from their shells. They develop what is called an egg tooth, which when you see a baby hatchling, I think in some of these photos, you'll see a white dot at the end of their beak or their bill. And what they do is they put that in the edge of the shell and then they flip over. So they're really like little drills or screws and they're able to exit the shell casing that way. That tooth will fall off after they do emerge. Um, like this little guy that you're looking at there, he, he's uh, one of the ones that was salvaged and he's lost his egg tooth. You can see a remnant in this photo. There's just a suggestion of where the egg tooth was attached, which is just, they're such a miraculous species. They really are full of fascination. Um, they truly are. Um, they're born pretty much unlike other species, knowing everything that they have to know. They can walk and swim and hide and uh, they can find their own food. Uh, so if you found a baby turtle, you would intervene only if it was deemed necessary. Like if the risk was high enough that, oh, it's never going to make it to the water source. It's got sewers to climb over or fences or exposure to predators. Then you can pick them up very generally, uh, gently rather. Their carapaces, their shells aren't hardened. They won't harden for a year. So they're very sensitive to pressure. So um, you can collect them and just take them to the water's edge and do what we explained before. Don't put them directly in the water, but on the shore's edge and uh, they, should, they should do fine. Sometimes they have so many obstacles in their way that they get confused. So that's when we should intervene because they, they sort of don't know left from right. They're learning geo mapping. That's why it's important. They're sojourned from the nest to the water. So um, that can be uh, a harrowing experience for them. So um, 
but you know, don't don't hesitate. If you think that it will benefit by your presence in transporting it, then certainly go ahead and do that. Sometimes it's difficult to figure out the waters that they came from. They should be returned to the water that the their mother most likely came came from. But sometimes that's hard to determine. So you bring them to the closest water source, the closest suitable water source. Um, and uh, mitigation. Um, wow, we're, as I said, we're just in the midst of mitigating the Westbrook wetland, which was always the number one hotspot in, in Kingston. So there is a proposal before council as we speak. We, the poaching incident, we decided to turn it into a positive. And the way we did that was two weeks ago, we launched an email campaign. We wrote a statement of support. It's not a petition because of the fact that the proposal is already before council. And the statement of support simply says, I'll read it here. Please accept this email as a statement of my support for the implementation of mitigation measures comprised of exclusion fencing, eco passages and alternate nesting sites at the Westbrook wetland located on Princess Street route number two between Collins Bay and Westbrook roads. So that's the pin post on on our Facebook page right now and we can never have too many letters so we strongly encourage you to please go there, copy that statement, put it in an email. And we've given the names and the addresses of the members of the environmental infrastructure um, transport committee, just copy and paste their names and their email addresses, put it in on, in one email. You don't have to send six. There's, there's six members. You will send one email addressed to the six people with that statement of support. You can embellish it if you want to. A lot of people have. They have uh, personal experiences, particularly on that wetland. One person was telling us she remembers a number of years ago where a volunteer from Sandy Pines, there were turtles everywhere and a number of them had been struck. So she actually put her car diagonally across the road to force the traffic to stop going either direction because the situation was crucial. We can't advocate that because we can only say that you should stop when it's safe to do so, but we certainly understand why. That is the reason that Turtles Kingston was reinitiated in 2018 because of my going through that wetland in the spring, not having turtle experience and looking around going, what is going on? Bodies crushed everywhere and nothing being done about it. So that's what prompted me to get involved in this uh, issue. Um, so we still recommend if you could please go to our Facebook page and to send that letter uh, statement of support, email statement of support. Um, there's other ways you can help volunteer. You can volunteer for an incredible organization like Sandy Pines. Their turtle department is uh, fantastic. I mean, they've uh, you know, responded to all the turtles that we've transported to them. Unfortunately, we were not able to operate our turtle trauma response program this year because of COVID, because of human contact. The veterinarians were operating with locked door policy, so we weren't able to run the program. Um, but there, we anticipated because of the availability of people through the no working a situation that they would be more available to help the turtles cross the road. And um, so we had less road mortality. The Ontario Turtle Conservation Center is actually half of the number that they had last year. Last year they had 1600, this year they're up, went to like 850. So we're not entirely sure why, but we think that that played into it. And um, uh, so there's, there's lots of things that can be done. Advocacy is huge. Um, on environmental rights, protection of wetlands, uh, protection of the turtles, bumper stickers. The bumper stickers are available. They're free. We print them. We donate them. Uh, if you want to make a donation to Sandy Pines, you can pick them up at Kingston Coffee at the Kingston Center. You can pick them up at the imprint um, uh, printing company on Bath Road. Uh, you can pick them up at Lee Valley. So uh, we want every second car to have a bumper sticker in Kingston. We want it to be so intimidating and in your face that no one is going to be able to deny that this is not a turtle city because they need the help. This is unique, a city in the middle of a wetland. 
So you can't even imagine the conflicts that come up. So we really have to sensitize the population um, that these guys need our help. Um, so reporting, there's two, uh, Turtle Tally, you can download the app. It's the Toronto Zoo Adopt a Pond. Um, we can't overemphasize the importance of reporting all of your turtle encounters, live, dead, injured. Um, those statistics profile the populations and they also can justify the implementation of mitigation measures. Like if, if uh, uh, turtles that are classified, you know, where they're uh, threatened or above, where their uh, habitats are supposed to be protected. Well, there's the documented proof. It would have made a huge different for, uh, difference for us for the Westbrook wetland had we had confirmed reports of Blanding's turtles. We know they were there, but they just weren't reported. So unfortunately, we can't rely on that information. There's also the program iNaturalist, which I strongly recommend that you look into. It's a fascinating program. It's not just for turtles. It's basically for everything. You can have a plant that's growing in your backyard and take a photo of it, and it's going to tell you what it is and basically how to take care of it. So that's another incredible, that's worldwide um, program that uh, can be used. The, it, it's great for kids. Kids like to do it. They feel like they're part of something. They're making a difference. They're making a report. Um, that's why we launched the use of Turtle Tally. It's very easy to use, very colorful. So, uh, and all that data is invaluable. So uh, I will end with that. And if there's any questions, um, I know that was a lot of talky talk. Um, one thing that I didn't say, um, in reference to uh, turtles is that they do have a language. Um, snapping turtles have a language it's based on frequency and they have two languages, one for distant communication, one for close communication and they're chatter boxes just before they emerge from the nests. Um, there was a show on PBS for sea turtles that they, a researcher a number of years ago was determined that they, they must communicate with each other. So sure enough, um, that confirmation came out and uh, they just did the same thing with freshwater snapping turtles. And you can actually hear the recording. Um, they make little beeping noises and uh, it, it's, it's just, it's really fascinating. It's, uh, there's a lot of information about them that we still don't even know. I mean, they've developed uh, ways of survival after 320 million years. So if there's any questions, I'd be more than happy to try to answer them. I should clarify, I am a citizen scientist. I am not a biologist. Most of the information that I try to provide is something practical that anyone can use. Anyone can use to help uh, limit the decline in their numbers. So I guess back to you, uh, Michelle, I don't know if there's- hey ben. I'm just gonna stop the share here. Okay. And uh, and say thank you so much for sharing all that. It's um it's always great to hear what what the latest is on the on the turtles, and of course to remind you what you don't always keep at the forefront of your mind, but to, re to remember those things, those important things to take away from it, which is very much about uh, you know just stopping and being aware of what what you're driving through, what you're looking at, um, yeah. what might be that tiny little guy running across the road that you might not necessarily yeah. see. And so uh, to stop and think, they are. They really are. It, um, I kind of wish all the stuff I kind of wish I'd known when I was little because I remember rescuing a uh, little painted turtle, and I think I named him Michael. Don't know oh, why, yeah. but um, it was uh, we we lived up to uh, Cataraqui Creek at the time, and um, oh, yeah. and I think I tried to you know adopt him for a, for a couple of days, and eventually my parents were like, no, you need to go release him. So that's what we went and did. Yeah. But uh, yeah. it was quite the experience to be able to engage on that that level. Oh, it is. And hold them in your hand because they're so tiny. They have some of those big, beautiful eyes, and yes. the colors are just amazing. They're so perfect. Like the ones yeah. in the photos that you have there, those guys are less than two days old. Oh I mean, God. from emergence. I just was sent a photo of a of a musk turtle, a stink pot. Right. And it's the size of a nickel. She put it next to a hatch, a snapper hatchling, and it's it's this little dot of a guy. They're they're the smallest species. So just amazing amazing little things they really are yeah um i'm just double checking to make sure if we have any questions come through so in case it's one of those uh let me just double check over here trying to keep tabs we lost uh we have summer students over the summer but they, they go back to school in the in the autumn oh, so now yeah. it's me handling everything uh, ah. so i'm just gonna go double 
we'll check the email side here. And if there are questions that people have or whatever, they can also even peruse our Facebook page because uh, if you go back in history, Absolutely. you'll see lots of posts addressing all definitely, kinds. Definitely, um, I've added the what and it, to, basically I've added that to the to the, the, the sorry the YouTube chat that uh, you can find Turtles Kingston on uh, on Facebook uh, at Turtles Kingston uh, and engage that way. And we just had there we go. Just had a question from. Um, somebody on YouTube, here we go, a couple more coming in. Um, okay. Suggested methods for keeping raccoons at bay um, on a driveway. Um, well, I guess they're making reference to nest protection. I would assume that's what they're trying to say there. Um, there are different methods. There are some- Potentially, but if they're driving over it. Okay, but raccoons. Uh... If it's on a driveway, that might be the- uh... Well, you see, that's the problem. Yeah, it's a, tra it is a, tra it's a traveled area. Okay, but I, I'm not sure how the raccoons have to do with that. But um, if there is a nest, as I said earlier, if there was a nest in your drive, like what, we had that often with the um, lakefront properties north of the city. And unfortunately, there's, there's, you're not supposed to tamper with the nest. So technically, you're supposed to pr protect it. And I know that's inconvenient. You can try to contact someone to uh, move them, they will move them under the definition of high risk. Um, but the best thing to do is to try to prevent that happen in, in, in the future. So that's why we say to cordon off your, your uh, laneway, even if, if this is the habit of the turtles, because they are going to be coming back. That's their instinct um, to create a substrate on the sunny, you know, in a sunny place located close to that, that will encourage the turtle to possibly nest there, and then it would be easy to protect her nest. But the one that's in your laneway that's already existent, that's going to be a little more difficult. I mean, technically, you would just have to try to manipulate around it. Um, so the best step is prevention, to put something around your laneway before nesting season, like the beginning of May, to prevent access to your laneway, knowing that it's likely to happen, and then to give them the alternate nesting site. That's uh, that's the idea. I mean, they were there long before we were. They have actually rights to those lands long before <laughs> we have. They're your landlord. So that's your landlord, really. There we go. Yeah. That's one way of looking at it. Um, so be, yeah. So basically, it's it's you know try to try to come up with those prevention methods, and if not, the nest nest protector is the best way to protect against the raccoons. Absolutely. Um, I take it. Yeah, that's and then it, um, of course, if it's in a driveway, that's going to prove difficult. Yeah, you'd have to you have to work around that. I mean, I know that it's kind of frustrating because it's already happened. But if you can anticipate that it's going to happen, I mean, even do it on a preventive level if you're not sure. Because if they're nesting somewhere else in your property, it's it's not going to be an inconvenience. But if they're nesting on your laneway, well then that is. So try to prevent that before it happens. And thing is with uh, predation, as far as raccoons and other uh, predators, uh, the when the female hydrates the eggs, she releases all the liquids in her body before she buries them. Well, that gives off a very powerful scent, especially within the first two weeks, but within the first 24 hours to 48, that to a raccoon is like, oh, dinner served. Great. So they'll just sniff that and zero right in. So people used to remove the nest protectors after two weeks. And I researched that actually and was instrumental in changing that perspective in this area to keep the protector on for the entire period of incubation because of the fact that it ends up that they do chat. They do talk to each other. And before they get to the um, emergence, they're chatting up a storm. So predators hear that. They have the ability to hear that. So that disavows where the nest is and they can be predated right through the entire incubation period of 60 to 90 days. So that's why we recommend keeping the um, nest protectors on for the entire period. And even after they start hatching out, uh, like a snapper can have as many as 50. So if you see like 10, um, leave it on for a couple more days because the other guys are a little slower and coming out it can take up to three days for them to dig their way out so uh leave it on for a couple of days for the overwinters if it's on your property you can actually leave the nest protector on for the entire winter if if you haven't seen any hatchlings exit but you saw that turtle nest and if it's a map turtle um 
lake country, they have a lot of map turtles. Just leave it on. Just be sure to take it off before the next nesting season. So take it off April, and you know, early April, so that the um, hatchlings that have overwintered could em emerge and move on their way. It's usually not an issue because the nest protectors have to be notched. They have to have at least two exits. Ours have four so that the turtle can leave of its own accord. So even if you left it there, the hatchlings can emerge, but you need to remove it to permit the female to nest again. That's the uh, that's definitely before mid-May, it should be removed. Yeah. All right. Well, I hope that uh, helps helps uh, imagine a number of people in the area that have uh, or county similar issues. So hopefully that uh, helps them going into the 2021 already. And um, do our best on our own to be able to uh, mitigate those efforts. Um, I'm just talking to see if we have any last uh, incoming questions. Uh, one question I had was just to kind of get an idea of what Turtles Kingston is, has plans for over the winter so that I guess you're off season if you have any activities that are happening or um, uh, anything people can get involved with or is it pretty much we don't wait particularly and, have take a holiday it, until uh, the spring. That's the turtle term for hibernation is broomate and, and that's basically <laughs> what we try to do and we've never been successful. Like last year, we were busier than we've ever been through the winter, uh, especially posting information because, uh, you know, people can focus and, and, and learn from it, whatever. And, um, but our big thing right now is the mitigation proposal. The engineering firm has been hired, the rotocologist has been hired, the, uh, it will be presented to council and then that uh, will go through. So next spring, it should be very busy because it's not only going to be Highway 2, it's going to be um, the road that goes to the development that was put in there because that road is going to become a municipal road and it's going to sorrowfully need um, exclusion fencing because the turtles are all over there. So that is being worked on as we speak. So that is going to be um, a huge project. It's the main reason why Turtles Kingston was relaunched in 2018. So when the last spike is put in and the, you know, alternate nesting has been addressed, I swear you're going to see somebody walking across that wetland and it's going to be me. <laughs> <laughs> I will be, I'll be drinking swamp water. <laughs> yes, definitely. Gosh. And a number of other people as well in this uh, that worked on the project as well over the years yeah a few of the councillors and uh, it's a green council and uh, it's a, the greenest i think that it's ever been in my experience so they're they're aware of the ramifications to nature and i think that um we're living we're living the ramifications of the impact that uh, nature has on our world um this pandemic that ties into uh uh, you know, something that evolved from a wet market in, in China. Uh, you re referred to soft shells. Soft shells are the number one turtle that is chosen by the Chinese population for soups. Um, there was a situation actually in Waterloo where there was a Chinese restaurant that was actually serving, and this is like 2013, serving soft shell turtle soup and the ministry walked in and goes what are you doing like this is completely illegal he had 54 of them in the freezer so they're really in big trouble because they've been decimated basically around the world they don't basically exist anymore in china um, they've all been they've all been eating eaten there, there's terrible videos as i made reference to that are on, on, online you have to be prepared to be able to see them but um, that's the reality of what's happening to this to this species they certainly don't deserve that especially based on myths no yeah but there's so much that people can do there's so it's such an exciting species there's just so much that people can do and just giving a little bit of time and effort and uh you know we can't call people to the road to road monitor for example because of insurance liability but if people show up we can lend them a high-res vest and say we'd be more than happy to have you help us uh, uh road monitor and nest sit and etc so um all kinds of things that people can do. Exciting things, interesting things, and interesting things they can share with their kids. And yeah, lots that can be done. Of course, just uh, spreading the word and, and making it something that you talk about so that uh, you that become that much more aware and, and, uh, 
and take note of what's as I say of what's around you because uh, yeah. once yeah. once you're aware of it in your mind you take you start to notice things differently and I think that's a, a huge part of it as well yeah exactly exactly it's uh it's uh, well exciting. thank you so much Maven um well, I think I don't see any other last questions that have come in so we'll leave it at that and of course if there are any last minute questions uh feel free to uh, reach out to K Turtles Kingston on Facebook um Facebook, and also you yes. can also Sorry, or you can reach out to uh, the Marie Museum at marmuse at mar. Sorry, I'm gonna I'm gonna check this into the chat for you, but marmuse at marmuseum.ca, and I'll be sure to pass them on to Maven uh, so that she can answer them for you. And once again, thank you everyone so much for joining us today. I hope you learned as much as I did. It's always a great topic, and I see there's lots of people saying thank you as well. So so much again, thank you so much, Maven, for joining us. Thank and, you. Um, thank you. Touch for the base again, perhaps next summer, and. Uh, yeah. We could do it on location when COVID knows? dies well, back a little bit, right? Yeah, we might be talking about uh, photos of mitigation and exclusion fencing. There, there we go. That'll be really exciting. All yeah. right. Thank well, you thank again you so much. Uh, and best of luck with uh, your advocacy and uh, hoping everybody can lend a hand this year. Thank you very much. And I thank the Marine Museum as well. And thanks to all the participants. All right. Take care, everybody. And uh, hope to stay sane, stay self, stay safe. And uh, be well. Best, of, best wishes for the, yeah, there you go. Be well. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye.